And he told his disciples and he told John the Baptist, go and preach the kingdom of God of heaven. Kingdom of the heaven. Trust God 
nor script for your journey, neither two coats, and all this physical stuff. And he gives that uh, command. That's the command. Now, we're one of his disciples. I want you to see this. He commanded his disciples in Matthew 10 to preach the kingdom of heaven. You and I are his disciples, and yet we would never preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. None of you have ever preached that. I have never preached that. In 53 years of ministry, I have never preached the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because things change. I'm commanded to preach the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is right now. The kingdom of heaven is still in the future. Things change. What change? He said to these disciples, go, you just, you just read it, go and preach to the house of Israel. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means something to the Jew. That means the Messiah is here. We're ready to set up the kingdom of heaven. Get ready. Get prepared. And they did. <clears throat> but the nation of Israel, look in chapter 12. In chapter 12, they rejected Jesus Christ. Look in verse 10, chapter 12, Matthew, verse 10. And behold, there was a man which had a withered hand. They asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it, lift it out? How much then, how much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Pay attention. Then the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, spiritually, then the Pharisees went out, held a council against him, how they might destroy him. How are we going to get rid of this Messiah or this guy that calls himself the Messiah? How can we get rid of him? Verse 15, but Jesus, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from this. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Now look in the same chapter. Um, look in... Help me find it. The word Gentiles. In chapter 12, after this. Eighteen. In verse 21. Look in verse 21. Also 18. 18. Look at 18. Now, here. It's only been a short time since Jesus told his disciples to go and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right now. It's coming. It's quick. People were baptized. Repent and be baptized for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's going to happen right now. Two chapters later, Jesus said, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. First time Jesus mentioned anything about the Gentiles, look in verse 21, and in his names, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Two chapters before, Jesus said, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go. Don't say anything to them. This is for the Jews. Jesus went to the Jews, presented himself as the Messiah, and the Jews said, no thanks. So Jesus said, okay, then we'll go to the Gentiles. Right there. It changed. Now, the Jews crucified their Messiah. They didn't want him. They said, 
We have no king but Caesar, Gentile. Jews said that. They said, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. Where did they say that? Right there. So Jesus said, okay, if that's the way you want it, then we'll turn to the Gentiles. And that's how you got saved. And that's how I got saved. So we should be glad for the Jews rejecting Jesus Christ. What about it? So we should be glad that the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. For the real thing. That's true. But we should not be. Any man can get saved at any time by doing what God tells him to do to get saved. I, I know what you're saying, and I do rejoice, and I teach that. You ought to be happy. The Jews rejected him because we got saved. But I also teach that any man at any time, in any place that wants to know God, God is obligated to reveal himself to him. And I get that from the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. I get that from Jeremiah who went into all the world and offered the truth of God to every man. So that's not... And what you say is true, and I believe that and I teach that, but that's not supposed to imply that if the Jews didn't had received him, that we would not have had a chance yes, yes. to be saved. Because that's just not true. Any man has a chance to be saved when he receives the truth of God for his time, for his, in his place. But what I am teaching here is that Jesus Christ, his intention Repent for the kingdom of heaven, 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 heaven is at hand. His intention was for the kingdom of heaven to begin here. But it didn't because the Jews rejected him as Messiah. Therefore, he changed the calendar and stretched it out at least 2,000 years. And that's what we call the church history. That's what we call the age of grace. And that's where we live right now at the end, just before the rapture. Now I said all that has nothing to do with Joel. It has everything to do with Joel. I said all that so we could explain and understand the prophecy of Joel. Now, here's the cross. Back here, 800 years is Joel. And Joel said some things that he wrote down, and God inspired them. God told him to write them down. I believe that. You have to believe that if you believe the Bible. He wrote, but he, he could see the Messiah coming, but he could not, he did not know whether the Jews would accept him or not. They rejected him so he could not see this time period here. He could not see the church age because it was still, it could be immediate, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or God could change it, and he did, to include us. But Joel couldn't see that back here. So when Joel prophesies, he prophesies without the church age. Now, if you separate or erase the church age, then you bring the second advent up here. This is, this is the first advent when Jesus is born in 
in Bethlehem. He came to die for our sins. He died on the cross. That's the first advent. And if you erase what we are in and know as the church age, then you bring this real close to this. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Joel could not see the church age. So he, when he writes, he writes as if the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's talking about the second advent. Do you get that? you understand that? Sir, that's the reason why he said in John 1, 11, he came into his own and his own received him not. Exactly correct. So it refers to the Jew. He came into his Jew. own, meaning his own is the Jew. Always uh, the uh, prophecies concerning the Messiah have to do with him coming to the Jew. It's always described to the Jew what they should be looking for. Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 9. This is what you should be looking for in the Messiah. But it doesn't mean, as what you have said while ago, that we have a gratitude with the Jews because they rejected him. In the time, if one of the Jews have accepted him, he will be saved also. Well, yes, except that where if the Jews had accepted him, we would be 2,021 years into millennium. And that's, that can't be. His millennium lasts 1,000 years. But after that, his government continues on. We would be 2,000 years into the kingdom of heaven. So would you have been born? Would the Philippines be here? Would they have the government that they have? Would the Muslims be, be praying to Allah five times a day? You know, it's, it's hard to imagine that if the Jews had accepted Jesus, the kingdom of heaven would have begun. You would have had no church age. If you have no church age, then in 2021, where are we? I, I can't answer that. Neither can you. We don't know. But they didn't. That's what we can operate on. We know that the Jews did not receive their Messiah and the church age came in and he turned to the Gentiles. We are Gentiles. We accepted him. We are in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is yet in the future. Mm -hmm. That's how you can, that's what you can safely say about where we are today. Now, mm -hmm. we haven't even started Joel yet, but I said all that to explain to you, Solomon was established as king. In our hearts, Jesus is established as king when he died for our sins, John 3, 16, we got born again, we're in the kingdom of God. Solomon, they put the, the crown on Solomon. He is king. But there are others that wouldn't receive him. Listen now. And they refused him and they were enemies of the kingdom. Solomon was established in his kingdom. But he was established for sure when his enemies were eliminated. Chapter 2, verse 10. He was established and then he was really established because his enemies were gone. Okay? Jesus is king. He's established in our hearts. But there's a lot of people that don't like Jesus. They don't believe he's the Savior. They don't believe he's God. So he has to eliminate his enemies. And at that point, then the kingdom of heaven will really be established. Jesus Christ can come, sit on the throne, 
rule with a rod of iron, and nobody opposes him. His kingdom is safe and established. That's yet to come. And that's what Joel is talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay? But Joel, once again, Joel is talking about this coming kingdom without any knowledge of what we just talked about, the church age, where the Jews rejected Jesus and Jesus turned to the Gentiles. If, you, if Joel were sitting here today, you would say, yeah, but Joel, here, the date, he lives in 800 B.C. Joel, wait a minute, wait a minute. You made prophecies about the kingdom of heaven, about the kingdom of God being established, about God, Jesus Christ killing, executing his enemy. But Joel, wait a minute, it's my day, my year, is 2021 A.D. That's 2,800 years after Joel's ministry. So you sit down with Joel and you say, Joel, what happened? What you said didn't happen. And he says, what do you mean? I'm in 2021 and I'm in the kingdom of God, but I'm not in the kingdom of heaven. And Joel says, you're talking to him. And Joel says, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Why? Because he couldn't see the option of the Jews accepting him and the kingdom. And there didn't have to be an option. And there shouldn't have been an option. The Jews should have received Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But they didn't. But they should have. But they didn't. But they should have. But they didn't. And because they didn't, 2,000 plus years added to the calendar of God in order to accommodate the Gentiles. Do you get that? And that's what Joel couldn't see. Now, Joel knows it now. But he didn't know it when he wrote the book. Does that mean that it's not Bible? No, it means it's exactly Bible. But all he could do was write what he saw. And he couldn't see the church age and a ministry to the Gentiles. The same is true with Daniel. The same is true with Jeremiah. The same is true as with Isaiah, Hosea. Amos, Obadiah, Joel, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. They couldn't see the option that God set there. If the Jews accept Jesus as Messiah, then things will work this way. And if they don't, then things will work this way. And that's why every... So their, their knowledge is uh, uh, limited. Because they are, they are not all-knowing. In a way, <laughs> let, let, me, let me ask you this. Do you know Did you my know? plans when this class is over? What am I, what am I going to do? Do you know? No. no. Does anybody know? No. My wife doesn't even know. I may go home and I may be tired. I may take a nap. I may be home, go home and I'm hungry and I'll eat. I may go home, my wife says, we need to go to the store. I get in the car and I drive away. I don't even know yet. It's not been established in my heart. So the, 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 re, the thing is, you don't know my plans for this afternoon. Does that mean your knowledge is limited? In a way, yeah. Yeah. I don't know which direction you're going to go on your motorcycle to go home. So when Joel wrote, he wrote what God told him to write. And at that time, not even God knew what was going to happen. Now God knows everything. And yet, he gave them an option. He gave us a choice. 
we can accept Jesus Christ and be saved and live the abundant life, or we can say, yeah, I don't like your Messiah. I don't like Jesus. I want to be a robber and, and go to jail. And God says, okay, that's your option. He made man with a free will. Now, to confuse you further, so that proves that man is not a robot. That's right. To confuse you further, and that's my whole goal, God did know. He did know whether you would accept Jesus as your Savior. And he did know whether the Jews were going to accept Jesus as Messiah. But he did not arrange things so that they had no choice or that we had no choice. He knew, but he did not predestinate. Yeah. That's the difference between foreknowledge and predestination. And predestination. Now, if God had chosen to predestinate that, then he could have given the knowledge of the church age to Joel and Daniel and all of those guys, and they would have written it down, and because they wrote it down, it would have to have happened, and the Jews would have had no choice. And if he, he knew whether you would be saved or not, and if you were, if he knew you were saved, you were going to get saved, and he wrote it down, then you had no choice in the matter. He would have eliminated free will. Yeah. But he didn't eliminate free will. And at the time that you and I got saved, we had a choice. You can't deny it. We did not, we had a choice. Now Calvinists would say you had no choice. Mm -hmm. A Calvinist would say way back here, before the foundation of the world, God chose Joel to be saved at a certain time, and God chose you to go to hell at the end of your life. That's what a Calvinist said. Way back here, before he created the heaven and the earth, he predestinated Brother, don't tell me, Nagante to go to heaven and Brother Sherwin to go to hell. And there's nothing you can do about it because you don't have any free will. That's what a Calvinist teaches. I don't believe in the Bible. Teach that. Now, one more thought on this, and then we'll go to the book of Joel, which we were supposed to be teaching an hour ago. Okay, one more thought. Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterian, a lot of Pentecostals, Assembly of God, some Southern Baptists, they believe, they believe that this is not really going to happen. Hmm. That in a spiritual sense, all of this has already happened. And they can explain from history, history along here, they can explain to their satisfaction that this has already happened and that Jesus Christ has already been victorious on all of his enemies and the thought that Jesus Christ will ever sit on a visible throne in Jerusalem and rule with a rod of iron is foolish. And you're foolish if you believe that because Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne of his kingdom today where? In the Vatican. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. That's not Jesus Christ. That's the Pope. <laughs> that's what they say. Yeah, that's it. That's the fulfillment the of all <laughs> of this. The Pope is the ruler. The Vatican of Christ. They said. <laughs> yeah. And he wears a mitre, wears a hat with a sign that says, Substitute Jesus Christ. <laughs> he does. He does. He does. He does. And they teach, all of those denominations teach 
that there is, forget about this, forget about this. It's not going to happen. Forget about the rapture. It's not going to happen. It's a figment of your imagination. It's already happened in that God caught you up into his love and his embrace when you accepted the kingdom of God and God loves you today and God even loves his enemies today. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes and that God is love and God is all forgiven and he's not going to come back and kill a bunch of people. That's not like God. He's a loving God. And there is no hell, so don't worry about judgment because God loves you. And here we are. All Let's all stand in a big circle. The Muslims, the Catholics, the Independent Baptists, they want this. Let's all stand in a circle and hold hands with one another and sing, Jesus loves me. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. That's <laughs> not true. That's the difference. That's the difference between a Bible believer and a religious person. Which are you? One word church. Yeah. <laughs> the Catholic Church. The kingdom of heaven. That's what they teach. And none of that's going to happen. Just forget about the rapture. Forget about the battle of Armageddon. Forget about tribulation. Forget about a literal throne in Jerusalem with Jesus Christ on it. That's, that's, that's not going to happen. We are already in God's kingdom in the church. If you don't believe me, go ask one of those. Go right here and ask for an appointment to see a priest at Magic Metal, Miraculous Metal Catholic Church. Go right there. Make an appointment to see the priest and ask him about this. And that's exactly what he'll tell you. Now, not in the words that I use, but that's what the theology of the Catholic Church and all those other denominations, that's what they teach. <laughs> Down when you come from town and you come up what I call the back way, you would come up to the intersection, um, and if you turn right, you go to SM Mall, and you turn left, you come up here to uh, uh, Europe, Europa, Grand Europa, right there at that intersection. If you follow that road on down, just before you get to town on the left is a Reform gyre reform congregation church. Okay. So that's how they're about. That's what they believe. That's what they believe. If you go downtown, there is a United yes, Methodist uh, Church. Yeah. That's what they believe. If there's a Presbyterian church in town, that's what they believe. Mormons believe just about the same thing, a little bit different. Jehovah's Witness just believe just about the same thing, generally. No head. No, you don't need that. Don't that. Don't believe Jehovah's Witness don't believe in the rapture. They don't believe in the millennium. They don't believe in the judgment of people. Uh, so, anyway, that's the difference between us, Bible believers, and the other people. Everything else, everything else aside from this book is religion. And religion is all the same. They will always preach that is love. They preach, religion preaches that you're basically a good person. And if you do enough good works, that God will weigh it in the balance. And if your good outweighs your bad, then you can be with God. And if you're if your bad outweighs your good, then you're annihilated, according to the Seventh Day Adventist, <laughs> or that you don't get to inherit a reformed earth, according to Jehovah's Witness, 
or you do go to hell, but it's not so bad. God put air conditioners in hell, so it's not so hot, according to the Catholic Church. <laughs> And if your relatives pay enough money, he can afford air conditioner <laughs> in hell, and it makes you feel better, and that's called purgatory. <laughs> and then if you've done a whole lot of good in oh, your yeah. life, I mean a whole lot, like Mother Teresa, or uh, some of the folks, if you've done a whole lot of good, and I mean a whole lot of good, and I mean a whole lot of good, then the church will make you a saint, <laughs> And you can go to heaven. That's the Catholic religion, Methodist religion, Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, Mormon, all just about the same. Now let's go to Joel. So Joel is looking at the future without the church age. Joel chapter 1. He is writing right here in about 800 years before Jesus Christ. He cannot see the church age. And he's looking at the second advent of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, ye old men. Okay, I'm listening. And give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. In other words, what I'm about to say is important for you, and it's important for all the people of the land, and it's important for old men, and it's important for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Listen up, that's what Joel says right here. Verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. What's he saying? It's going to get bad. Then it's going to get worse. Then it's going to get worse then it's going to get still worse. That's what he's talking about. All those bugs eat crops. And if you think you're hungry now, just wait until the palmer worm gets done, and then after that, the locust, and after that. These are plagues. These are things that are bad that are going to happen to the Jews. Joel is preaching to the Jews 800 years before Jesus Christ, their Messiah, is born. And he said, things are going to get bad. Why are they going to get bad? Because the nation of Israel is idolatrous from Hosea. We're just right there to the left. One chapter is Hosea. You remember Hosea? And Hosea said, listen, you've not been faithful to God as his wife. God divorced you. You're nothing but a whore. And God's going to deal with you. And yet, you remember in Hosea just a couple weeks ago, God's mad at you and he's going to judge you. And yet, his covenant with Abraham is still there. And in the middle of your judgment, he's going to bring you into the wilderness and deal with you and reveal himself to you and you will restore that marital relationship with God. That's always the hope. God cannot break his covenant with Abraham and he will not and he does not. And so Joel starts out the same. God's going to punish you and if you think you're hungry now just wait till the palm worm gets done Wait till the caterpillar gets done. Wait till the locusts get done. And it's really going to be worse. Verse 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth all of the good times, both with fresh grape juice, new wine, or with old wine to keep you from looking, looking 
Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Keep your finger in Joel and go to Proverbs 31. Look what God says. Verse 3, Proverbs 31, 3, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, let they, lest they drink and forget the law, pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Now look at verse 6. He says, Give strong drink unto them that are ready to perish, and wine to those who are that be of heavy hearts, let them drink, let them forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. So, strong drinks and wine are for those that are dis depressed, discouraged, suicidal, <laughs> in having problems. So, <laughs> if that's your condition, then drink. <laughs> It'll help you to forget. <laughs> Now there's another choice. You can ask the Lord to save you and you can repent of your sins and get new life, abundant life. But if you don't want to do that, drink. Go down to the liquor store, go down to the bar and drink. If you're suicidal, if you're discouraged, if you're depressed, if you can't trust the Lord, drink. And that's what Joel is saying in verse five. Verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, and ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. In other words, all of your hope, all of your pleasure is cut off in, when God deals with the Jews. Verse 6, for a nation is come up upon the land strong and without number whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. The Bible says the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we're looking at trouble from the devil here against the Jews. Why? Because of idolatry and because they weren't faithful to God. Verse 6, and he hath the cheap teeth of a great lion. <coughs> He hath laid my vine waste, barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away, and the branches thereof are made white. What in the world is he talking about? Okay. To bark a tree means a lion or a bear comes to a tree. They actually do this. They pick out a tree for some reason. They take their claws and they make an X on the tree. I don't know why. You can research it if you want. But that means to bark a tree. Their claws are in the bark and it takes the bark of the tree off and makes it clean bear. Now Joel says that's what the devil is going to do to you the nation of Israel. He will bark your tree and make it clean, bare. I, I don't know about you, but that's not good news if I'm involved. And that's what Israel is involved. And God told Joel to tell Israel, this is what your future is. <laughs> Verse 8, lament, cry, lament, cry like a virgin. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Is, is a, a, a virgin that's going to get married, a bride, is she supposed to wear sackcloth? Sackcloth is a very, like a burlap sack, like you would buy rice in. Rough, hard. Tough. That's not, that's not what a virgin, a bride, is supposed to wear. A virgin is supposed to be tender and sweet and soft and easy. Who would want to marry a bride that was like a burlap sack? <laughs> Nobody. 
And that's the way Israel became because she was unfaithful to God and trusted in idols. And he says, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. That's not the way it's supposed to be. God didn't want Israel to be hard and rough like a sackcloth, but that's the way she was. Verse 9, the meat offering, the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, um, the Lord's ministers mourn. Things are bad. The field is wasted, so there's nothing to eat out in the field. The land mourneth. For the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth, the oil, uh, olive oil. Now look, Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, that was God on earth. That's his creation. Jesus told his disciples, in I believe the book of Luke, he said, take 5,000 people. 5,000 people were hungry. And Jesus Christ said, take them out into the deserted place, the desert, and make them sit down upon the grass. I've been to Israel. Ain't no grass. <laughs> You've seen pictures of Israel. It is a deserted, barren, dry, unfruitful place. In fact, my wife and I, we've been to Ireland, gorgeous. We've been to Romania, like a postcard. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. We went to Israel. We went to Israel to see the sights concerning the Bible. But Rob, one time Robin looked at me, we're in the bus, we're traveling. There's nothing but barren, dirty, worn out land that can't produce anything. And she looked at me, looked out the window, and she says, well, why did we come here? <laughs> well, I know why we came here, and we were satisfied with what we went for, but there's nothing beautiful in Israel. And yet, <clears throat> Jesus said, go out there in the desert and make them sit down on the grass. And he used the word grass. Interesting. When the children of Israel were traveling in the wilderness, God promised them a land flowing with, say it with me, milk and honey. Does this description sound like God's fulfillment of giving them a land flowing with milk and honey? No. Does it sound like a land where you can go out in the desert and sit upon the grass? Ain't no grass in Israel. I can't give you one verse. It would take a whole lot of verses together to prove what I'm about to say. Well, what I'm about to say is when the people of the land accept Jesus Christ as Messiah or Savior, God heals their land, and it's fruitful, and it's bountiful. But when people reject the Lord, it's barren. Now look at, look at Saudi Arabia, look at Iraq, look at Iran, look at Syria. Look at these lands of Muslim lands where they've rejected Jesus as their Savior and it's desert. Look at Egypt, the Sahara Desert, look at Saudi Arabia. All they have is petroleum a mile under the sand. Mm. They've got sand and they've got petroleum and they're rich, but they can't grow any grass unless they flood a certain area with water and make grass grow. But grass doesn't just grow up. Look at the grass over here. We didn't plant that grass. 
There is no grass. Look at the grass in your yard. But a, a nation that rejects the Lord as their Savior generally mm -hmm. is barren. Mm -hmm. And the Israel is barren right now. Mm -hmm. And will be barren until the time in tribulation. Mm -hmm. when, and what did he say? He said, the canker worm, the locust, the palmer worm, all of those things, whatever grows that's going to be fruitful, God sends a plague and it's unfruitful. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot to be taught in that. But that's what I think. In chapter 1 and verse of, sir. Yeah. So that's the, now I understand that the, in the second Chronicles 5.17, if the people uh, right. will heal their land, yeah. people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Right. That is referred to the Israelites again. That's a good reference. And he said, I will heal, I will heal their land in yeah. the future. Yeah. That's pretty good for Absolutely. So and, not, during the millennium, there's going to be four harvests in millennium. And the Bible says the one that's planting, the guy out there planting, he's overtaken. No, I'm sorry, the guy that's reaping the harvest and picking the fruit, he is overtaken by the guy that says, get out of my way, I have to plant the next crop. You don't have four harvests here or in the United States or in Russia or anywhere on earth. But in millennium, in the land of Israel that is barren now, you're going to have four harvests. And the land will be flowing with milk and honey. And there is grass everywhere. But God healed their land because they received the Messiah. Uh, so it right. cannot be applied here in the Philippines because most preachers, when they preach, they, they, they emphasize it. Uh, the application was, uh, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, they spiritualize it. But the reality is that verse is uh, referring to a certain group of people, yeah, yeah, which is Israel. Uh, That's correct. The, uh, the okay, I'm going to read that Chronicles. Thank you. Joel chapter one and verse eleven. And Joel is preaching, and he's preaching on the street. By the way, mm -hmm. every preacher in the Bible was a street preacher. There's no auditorium here. There's no air conditioning. There's mm -hmm. no electric lights. Mm -hmm. There's no protection from the rain or the heat. He's yeah. outside. Look what he says in verse 11. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perish. Now look. God says... Your land is barren because I'm punishing you. Mm. And if you think you're hungry now, just wait. It's going to get worse. And he says, if you do grow something, I'll send the palmer worm. Then I'll send the locust. Then I'll send the canker worm. And you are under a curse. What does the Bible say in John 3, 36? It says... But it, uh, I can't quote well, You don't need to turn. But listen, right here. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Present tense, right now. You believe on Jesus Christ, so the blessings of God are available to you. A person that doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is already condemned. Um, mm. yeah. His name is on the roll call of hell. He's waiting to die to go to hell. The only thing keeping him out of hell is his living flesh. 
Yeah. Now tell that to somebody as you witness to them. The only thing keeping you out of hell is if your heart beats another minute. Because when you die, the rich man died, was buried, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes. That's what. Well. Now that's true with a person, and it's true with a nation. And that's what we're seeing here, is Joel's prophecy to the nation of Israel. Verse 12, the vine is dried up, the fig tree languishes, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The, the, you don't have any joy in serving idols. Hmm. There's no joy in religion. Go down to, and I've done this, go down to Gaston Park, to the big St. Augustine Cathedral. Sit there in the park and watch people going into the church for a mass. Notice their expression. And then watch people coming out of the mass and notice their expression. There's no change. Yeah. There's no joy. There's no rejoicing. Because religion cannot give you joy. Preach. Amen. Sir, can we say now that uh, people, uh, countries, most likely in the Middle East, were part of God's punish, punishment Absolutely. And, and curse? Absolutely. That's why they, they have a great desert. You know, you remember Nini, my friend from Eligan City, he has been here, he has taught this class before. Nini went to Israel several times. I've been there once. But Nini got to go from Israel, listen carefully, to the, what's called, um, Gaza Strip. Now you hear about that in the news. That's where the Palestinians live. They're enemies of Israel. You watch the news for a couple of days, you'll see where the Palestinians sent missiles over to Israel. They're right next to each other. And Israel shot them down with their defense system called the Iron Dome. It's all over the news every week. So, now there is a line. I've been to that line where Israel is here and the Gaza Strip is here. The Palestinians are here, Israel is here. Now Israel has been blessed by God with a knowledge of how to take care of the land, even though there's no grass growing in the desert like we've said, Israel has learned how to irrigate and bring the system so that they can produce fruit and probably if you go to a grocery store, if you go to Ayala Mall and go into Roostons, when you buy their fruit there, you probably got it shipped from Israel. Mm -hmm. Because a large percentage of the fruit all over the world comes from Israel. Why is that? God's blessing? Well, in a sense, that God blessed them with the knowledge of how to irrigate and that. So part of Israel, in fact, the, Jez, the Valley of Jezreel, where the Battle of Armageddon will be held. I've been there, I've seen that. It's a very fruitful valley, and that's where they grow the stuff that they send to Roostons and you buy. Okay, right next door to Israel is the Gaza Strip, where the Palestinians, they're Muslims. They hate your God, they hate Jesus Christ. And meaning, I've been to the gate where you have to go into Palestine, I'm not Palestine, well, it is Palestine, but it's the Gaza Strip. I've been to that gate, I can show you a picture at the entrance of the gate, and it says, no Christians or Jews allowed. I can show you that picture, it's on my computer, not on my phone. No Christians or Jews allowed. You walk through that gate 10 feet, and it looks like 
downtown Manila, the ghetto area, no. the uh, uh, vandalism, the graffiti, no, no, the no. poverty, the uh, unhappiness, the barrenness, the trash on the streets. They don't even collect gardens. You just throw it out the window. No, it's no. dirty. It's unhealthy. It's unclean. Ten feet. Ten feet. Ten feet from Israel, which is blessed. True. Yeah, yeah. True. I wasn't allowed yeah, to go to that much. area because they were having problems at that time. Yeah. But Nini has been through the gate and into the Gaza Strip. And that's what he said. You go 10 feet and it changes just like that. I'm telling you, the blessings of God are worth it. Thank God for your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Messiah. Because we enjoy the blessings of God. Let's try to finish chapter 1. Go back to Joel chapter 2. I'm sorry, Joel chapter 1 and verse 14. Joel 1, 14. Sanctify you a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto God. You know, he's preaching the same thing he preached. Repentance toward God. He said, repent. Go to the house of God. That's Solomon's temple. It was built in the standing at the time of Joel. And Joel says, go there. Cry out to God. Ask him to save you. Not saved in the sense of New Testament Jesus Christ in your heart. But saved in the sense that God, we've done wrong, we repent of our idolatry, heal our nation. Verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Joel said, repent for the day of the Lord is at hand. He's talking about the second advent. They're preaching the same thing. He says, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and of destruction, and as of destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Uh, is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? You've seen plenty of people that are unseen have fun, but you've never seen them have joy. There is no lucky joy. Joy is different. It's different from fun. <laughs> joy is in Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. And if you don't have amen. Jesus Christ, you don't have joy. You have fun. You yes. have an exciting time. Amen. You ride a roller coaster and scream. But joy is to be found in the Lord. Verse 17. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down. For the corn is withered. In other words, the blessing is in the Lord. And right now you don't have the Lord. So you've got the curse of the Lord. Verse 18. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture, no grass. I told you, no grass. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And so Joel says, because your nation and your land is in this condition, go to the house of God and cry out and call upon him for his mercy, because you are idolatrous. And God will heal you because of his covenant with Abraham. But if you don't do this, you think you're hungry now, it's only going to get money. And that's what the prophecy of Joel is all about. Next week we'll study chapter 2 and 3.
uh, any questions, any discussion, your lunch is served. Let's pray. Thank God, you. burn these truths uh, into our hearts. Help us to apply them to our ministries today. And help us to enjoy the joy of the Lord and the blessings of God in the person of Jesus Christ. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.